actually, um, we just finished a uh, two-part series on the Philippians, uh, on, the, on the letter to Philippians, uh, with joy as the theme of our, our overall theme of the sermon series. But today, it was supposed to be Gospel Sunday, and throughout Cross Point, different campuses, we have an evangelistic message. Uh, what is Gospel Sunday? Well, basically, we want to insert some uh, special Sundays where we explain the basics of Christian faith. Um, they say gospel message and, and stuff like that. So, uh, especially since people come in at different stage, some people are new to uh, Christian faith. So, this is an opportunity for us to kind of step out a little bit of our new normal routine and explain some basic about uh, Christian faith, and if you have been Christian for a long time, well, consider this a, an opportunity to review uh, some of the basics we, we know, but, um, but also uh, maybe you will learn a few things. Uh, so um, I want to talk about today uh, the, the, something I call the Pauline spirit, uh, and um, I went to a, a St. Paul's College uh, uh, in Hong Kong for high school, um, and that idea of a Pauline spirit, the spirit of uh, the Apostle Paul, is thrown a lot uh, around. But I never get, uh, growing up in, in the school, uh, a def definitive answer what this thing called Pauline spirit is really about. Uh, the school was founded in 1851, and it actually celebrated 170th anniversary this past academic year. So it was one of the oldest, uh, second oldest school that is still in operation in Hong Kong. The oldest school was actually called Yinghua College. It was founded in 1880 uh, by um, the one of the first um, Protestant missionaries to, to China, Robert uh, Morrison in Malacca, uh, before he moved the school to Hong Kong in 1843. But uh, St. Paul's College was the second oldest school in Hong Kong. Now, because of the long history of my uh, alma mater, this notion of Pauline spirit shaved the lives of a generation of, obviously, his students. But because it was such an old school and uh, with so many leaders raised through that school, it also influenced a generation of leaders uh, in, uh, in the city of Hong Kong, um, this, the culture of this former British colony. And I would say the idea of Pauline spirit is the key to understand this place uh, called Hong Kong. And um, you think about it, the essential Pauline spirit is an important key to understand the entire Christianity, the Christian worldview, the foundation of Western civilization. There are more books in the Bible written, than, uh, written by the Apostle Paul than any other writers. Um, the words uh, written by Paul and his close associate, uh, Dr. Luke, made up more than half of the Greek New Testament. Now, so, but what's St. Paul, uh, what's, uh, what's the Pauline spirit? Now, my, my school has a school song, right, the St. Paul's College, and it identified four words for the school. Uh, justice, honor, truth, and virtue. Now, as an old boy, I would confirm that those are indeed some of the core values the school tried to impress on her students. And certainly, they are Christian values that we can find in Pauline writings. Uh, but the song also has another expression huh, of the Pauline spirit in the line, all for each and each for all. Now, although the phrase was popularized by the three musketeers, uh, the clear, the, clearly the idea traced back uh, to the Apostle Paul who wrote in Romans uh, chapter 12, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This idea where people are responsible and take, uh, uh, for one another, um, referred to uh, as subsidiarity, by, often by Roman Catholic theologians, connects the purpose of the society as a whole with the dignity of an individual. Um, everyone can and must take care of one another. And it is really the foundational value of the democracy in the modern Western world. 
Um, for example, you look at the famous NATO Article 5 stipulates that an armed attack against one or more of the member nations in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. And that's why you see some um, all the country nowadays want to join NATO. I mean, they're afraid of Russia, obviously. But the Apostle Paul actually came to such conviction of human solidarity only after he became a Christian. Growing up, Paul uh, was taught a kind of Jewish elitism uh, or superiority. And that concept of Jewish superiority was actually an import from the Roman system of aristocracy or, or noble birth. Uh, and it was sort of reinterpreted into the Jewish mindset. The young Paul thought of the Jews as a superior race chosen by God. In, in addition, Roman imperialism helped shape his uh, Jewish nationalistic seal uh, as a Pharisee, Pharisees, uh, which means the separate one, right? Uh, they are set apart. The revival and ascendance, reascendance of the nation of Israel was his life goal as a young man. But Paul's will will was completely changed the day he met Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus. As we read in Philippians chapter 3, Although I have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else think he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisees, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Now what did Paul mean by uh, the, confident in the confidence in the flesh, in the immediate context, it refers to circumcision. If you are circumcised, you have the birthmark of a Jew, the chosen people of God. So this, this idea, this phrase, uh, confidence in the flesh, is an implicit endorsement of his theology of Jewish ethnic superiority which actually came from the Roman concept of aristocracy. Now, Romans were not the only people uh, in the ancient world who believed in aristocracy. Uh, Plato, I mean, the Greek philosopher Plato, thinks, actually, democracy is the worst form of government. Uh, it end, like his teacher end up being killed because of that. And if you look east, Hinduism and Confucianism in China, China also justified the privilege of the ruling class by appealing to their noble birth. So this concept of elitism defends the privilege of the noble class by claiming that, well, you know, certain people are born superior morally, intellectually, and everything else. They deserve the right to rule over others. They are actually still uh, elitist, uh, today, of course, like modern defenders of elitism argue that aristocracy doesn't necessarily mean exploitation of the poor. Those of noble birth, they can be taught um, they need to take care and to be merciful of the poor since they were young. In fact, I mean, the, today you, think, you find an elitist, they will say, well, they will try to teach others to be more like them, to become noble themselves. And for the youthful poor, Jews are the best people. Therefore, the kindest thing the Jewish elites could do is to make everyone, make all people more like themselves, make them all Jewish. But the question is, is elitism and aristocracy something Moses actually taught the Israelites leaving Egypt? Far from it. According to Moses, the Israelites must be kind to aliens, widows, and the orphans, not because they are better people, but because they are no better. The Israelites take care of the poor because they were once poor in Egypt. Uh, you read, 
When an alien resides with you in your land, you must not oppress him. You will regard the alien who resides with you as a native born among you. You are to love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Moses made it clear that, the, that God uh, didn't really see the Israelites as a better people. Uh, God sent the Israelites to take over Canaan, not because they deserve to rule over the Canaanites, but because God is simply using them to bring judgment to all the evil nations in the land of Canaan. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord, your God, will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Unlike most other ancient social order, the Mosaic law strongly discouraged monarchy and aristocracy. Moses did not consider Israelites a superior race. Internally, the Levites, the tribe of Levites, who served as priests, was meant as a tribe of servants rather than a ruling superiors um, to the other tribes. That's why they didn't even get land. Therefore, if you think about it, the Jewish elitism and ethnic superiority of the youthful, youthful poor did not reflect the spirit of Moses. It came from the aristocratic ideology of the surrounding pagan cultures. But the day Paul met Jesus Christ, the savior of all nations, Paul also rediscovered Moses, the idea all for each and each for all is the spirit of Moses. And um, you can find the idea of a commonwealth based on God's grace. And that idea of a commonwealth is found in every page of Mosaic law. Nobody inherently deserved anything. Everyone would have nothing if God does not provide. And just as God can give, God can take away. Therefore, be sympathetic to those who have not. Now, when you think about it, right, perhaps there are things in your life that you're proud of and make uh, you feel like you belong to a superior group and you, you, you deserve a membership to a certain you know, elite. Perhaps you came from a very famous family line, I don't know. Maybe you went to a prestigious school, right? Perhaps you have an accomplished career, or perhaps you belong to a certain income bracket, right? But instead of seeing yourself as a member of a certain elite class or a member of a certain exclusive club, you can just take those as gifts from God. Now, I personally, I don't have much bad things to say about going to a more prestigious schools. It opened a lot of doors, and companies pick you, pay you a, a big bucks to recruit you to work for them if you come from a better school, right? There's nothing wrong to become, uh, um, to, to, to work hard and to be successful until you develop a, a better-than-thou attitude, until you become uh, someone who believes in entitlement. More importantly, we have to always remember money is not omnipotent. Now, said there are many things in life that money cannot buy, even if you belong to a certain income bracket. There are a lot of problems in the world that you cannot solve. Um, we are having a, a health seminar uh, just like down the, uh, in a hub, right? Think about it. Health is not something you can buy. Uh, recently, I, um, I've been reminded quite a few times by our brothers and sisters. They, uh, they, they, they go to a boat cruise and they, they, they all catch like, the, the, the Omicron uh, COVID virus, right? So money can buy you a ticket to a luxurious boat cruise, but it cannot buy you immunity from catching COVID, right? So money can buy you a lot of food that gives you a lot of sugar. Your blood sugar can go up, but it's very hard to buy things that go, make your blood sugar go down. Money cannot buy love. 
Now, if you come with your, your husband, come with your, your wife, like, take a good look. <laughs> Let me ask you, right, how much money do I have to give you uh, to let go? <laughs> Can anyone pay you enough money to take that person next to you away? See, some of the best things in life are free, but others are simply priceless. When my wife Irene and I got married, we decided that I could uh, quit my day job and study full-time at seminary because, uh, like uh, Pastor Leung said a few times ago, uh, with Helen Sebo, uh, 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 Irene can pay the mortgage, so uh, I don't have to go to, uh, go, go to get my, day, uh, my pay. Well, the two persons can live together. At that time, though, I was working uh, at a pretty successful tech startup that was really doing quite well. And uh, my boss was quite pleased with my work. Uh, and uh, for example, I, I filed a, a patent for them. Um, although the patent has expired now, like patent lasts for 20 years, you can still find it in Google Patent by looking up my name and the keyword name space. Now, not to brag, it's quite a clever patent. So my, my boss uh, heard that I want to quit. Of course, they want me to stay, right? And they work out a deal. They say, okay, I, I can keep my, all my founder stock options, vesting schedule, if I would just stay part-time, like kind of be there. But see, I made this little pledge with God, right? If this smart lady is dumb enough to agree to marry me and support my study and my ministry, I have no excuse to not let go of my day job, right? So no matter how much money they throw at me, I'll honor my pledge. I cannot break my vow to God, right? Otherwise, who knows, right? God gives and takes away, right? Maybe she wise up and change her mind before she put on the ring, right? So no, I cannot risk that. Anyway, long story short, that company did go public, and hypothetically speaking, I did give up a bucket of gold. But did I ever regret? Nah. And I'm sure anyone who knows my smarter half will agree that I get the better end of the deal. See, stock options can feed me like, I don't know, three, five years and patent expire after 20 years. My wife, Irene, is still feeding me and is coming to 25 years by October this year. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. But there are even more precious things in life than health and love that money cannot buy. Personal integrity and moral characters are not what money can buy. No amount of money laundering can clean a corrupt conscience. Money cannot give you righteousness because whether you are a righteous person is not judged by yourself, is judged not by the people around you. Whether you are a righteous person is judged by God alone. And God does not take bribe in His judgment. Those judged to be righteous will receive reward in heaven, but those judged to be unrighteous according to the Bible, will go into the eternal fire of hell. As Paul told the Romans, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistent in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. But as Paul would later recognize, like he grew up thinking that, and that's why he did all what he, what he did while he was a young man. No matter how hard we try as human beings, we cannot meet God's standard of righteousness by our own effort. Did his seal for the restoration of Israel make Paul really a more righteous person before God? Paul knew deep down, even before he met Christ, the answer is no. Rather, his religious seal only turned him into a hypocrite, a terrorist, a monster, an oppressor of the weak and the innocent. What corrupted him is not the pagan culture. It is this thing called sinful nature, common to all mankind, that he cannot overcome. It makes no difference, even though he is Jewish. But as he continues in Philippians 3, verse 8, he found the answer the day he met Jesus. 
More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Although neither Paul nor any one of us can be righteous by ourselves, God has made it possible to obtain our righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. When you think about what is righteous, it is walking a straight path. And by ourselves, we always veer to the side and got lost because we are blind spiritually and are misled all the time by the voices of a lost world. The only way to keep our eyes on the goalposts of righteousness is by looking at the standard goalposts, Jesus himself. Righteousness begins and ends with believing in Jesus Christ because he is the only absolute goalpost. As Paul recounted his life story before King Agrippa in uh, Acts chapter 26, he admitted how lost he was as a young man. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own people in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time. If they are willing to testify that according to the strictest of our religion, I live as a Pharisee. In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in person since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. The young Paul, known as Saul, basically sold his soul to the Jewish elitism, to the authority. His misguided worldview became a source of his anger against those people who would disagree with him. And a lot of them were Christians. But his world turned upside down the day he met Jesus. I was traveling to Damascus on, under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priest. While on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from people and from your people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What truth did Christ open Paul's eye to see? Simply put, that by believing in him, Jesus Christ, people of all nations will be forgiven and sanctified, separated out for holiness, just like they, what they want to be as Pharisees. The righteousness that Paul worked so hard to obtain by his own effort, God would just give out for free to anyone who believed in Christ. It is because Jesus Christ already died for the sins of all people, not just Jews, but certainly including the Jews, by his atoning sacrifice, Jesus Christ removed the unrighteousness in all of us who believe in him. Now, other religions tell people to do good works, to redeem for their offenses against the gods. But in Christ, all transgressions of the believers are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
In Christ, righteousness is not based on our own self-redeeming effort. Nobody can pay money to do good works to meet God's standard of righteousness. It is because Jesus Christ himself is the standard of righteousness, and Jesus Christ has been the only person who has met that standard. So the only way to become righteousness is through joining Jesus Christ by faith. Believing in Jesus Christ means accepting that we are powerless in removing unrighteous desires in our own heart. We are sick to the core. The cleansing of our soul can only come from the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit alone. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot clean ourselves. Only God can do it for us. Believing in Jesus Christ means there's no point to pretend that you are better people anymore. You are not. You're just like everybody else. For Paul, it means rejecting the Jewish elitism he grew up with. Now, Christians confess that we are no better or worse than other people by our own sinful nature. All we can do is to exercise the spiritual gift that God has provided for each of us and use that gift to point people back to the righteous path of Jesus Christ. Because there is a judgment after death that awaits us all. We need to be right with God. Some people think God is too kind and too merciful to judge or send people to hell. I kind of think that that's kind of like that San Francisco DA who recently got recalled, right? He thinks that crime shouldn't be persecuted. But can God be just if he acts like that? That is not mercy. That's abuse. But you will agree that justice demands God's judgment for all people. It goes without saying that you need to think seriously where you personally stand in that final judgment. Let's put it this way. If the Bible is right, and Jesus Christ is the standard of righteousness by which God judges, where do you stand? Therefore, for Paul, the way to righteousness is to live his life as if Jesus himself is living it. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. In fact, the the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ became the goalpost of Christian life for Paul. I began today by asking, what's Pauline spirit? And if we can name only one idea about the focus of Pauline spirit, it is to know Christ. Now, if you are non-Christian, uh, or if you know some non-Christians, I'm sure you probably ask or have been asked, why do I want to know about Jesus Christ and why do I want to become a Christian? Now, other might have told you about the many benefits of uh, becoming a Christian. Uh, you can be more successful at school, or maybe you can have a happier marriage, or at least it can correct some bad behaviors and bad habits, right? Now, not that those practical benefits were not true. They are. It doesn't get to the bottom of our life go as Christian. Paul would give you a two-part answer to the question why you want to know Jesus. First, the goal of human life is to be righteous so that we receive the approval of God at the final judgment. Second, to believe and know Christ is the only way we obtain that righteousness for Jesus Christ is the standard of righteousness. And that two-part answer is the essential Pauline spirit. So that's why he said, for one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Everything else in life is just secondary. You think about it, they are just circumstances God put in your life journey 
to guide you back into the path of righteousness, setting you up to know Christ. Now, perhaps along the way of your life, God has given you some money, some fame, some prestige, some success as encouragement to walk in the right path, to walk in righteousness. That's all good. Perhaps God has given you some moment of success to be doing what is good. But I tell you, consider them as door prize. You want to win the first prize. But remember, even if most circumstances God had put in your way have been miseries, setbacks, and failures, they don't matter at the end. Like Paul said, forget about them. What matter is that whatever whether your life is ultimately how it is judged by God, that is what is ahead. See, you probably didn't live a, a wretched life as the young Paul before he knew Christ. But even Paul would be fine at the end because he obtained that righteousness of Christ by knowing and believing in Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps you, you have made some bad decision in life that you regret, uh, hope you have been regretting ever since. But in Jesus Christ, all are forgiven the day you gave your life to Him. The important thing is, let go of what is behind. Whether you are proud of yourself or where you feel ashamed of yourself, it doesn't matter. All these earthly things will soon expire, will soon pass, like Paul said. What we need to do is set our goal on Jesus Christ. For, as he told the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. As we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, He will transform our body of a humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body, by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for um, giving us this um, day that we can come together into your house to worship you. And uh, we, uh, we know that we, don't, we, we didn't get to come here by accident, but you guided us here for one reason or the other. Um, and we also know from the, the word of Paul that you want us to be like Christ because ultimately it's all that is matter is that do we live a life worthy of the salvation that he has given us. And for those who are still not so sure about our, our salvation and our, 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 our stand before you and the judgment table, I pray that today that you would come into our heart and Give us confidence that you are real. You are very real. And by holding on to the blood of Jesus Christ, we can stand righteous before you. And we would even receive heavenly reward and be with you. But we'll also be reminded, Lord, that we are, we are so blind and we are got so tempted by all the things in the world Help us to resist those temptations so that we can focus our eyes upon Jesus. And with that power of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, let's uh, finish by uh, singing the last song again, could we? Uh, the first song we, we sang earlier. Yeah. <laughs>